Hear the word of the Lord. And as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. The word of the Lord. This is our sixth sermon in our series Encounters with Jesus. Five of those sermons involve a miracle. Four of them involved a healing miracle of the sick. One of them involved the miracle of the great catch of fish. This encounter with Jesus is a little bit different because on the surface you find that there is no miracle as such. A man runs up to Jesus and kneels before him. By reading this account in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see that he is a rich young ruler, probably a synagogue official. And we must commend this man at the outset. He, he's not like so many clamoring for healing from Jesus. He shows he's eager by running to him. He shows honor by kneeling and calling him good teacher. He asks the right question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This is a pastor's dream. He's on a mission. He wants something and he's going to discover that in and of himself it is impossible. Now, if you look at the context, Jesus has just told us in the previous passage to look to the example of the children. They show us what the kingdom of God is like. Receive the kingdom like a little child, with childlike faith, or you will not enter. By contrast, however, this man is anything but childlike. He is, in fact, very self-sufficient. What will Jesus do? What would you do? The disciples must have thought, this man would really be good on the team. He's rich, he's influential, let him hang with us for a while. He's connected, he could help. Jesus, don't let this one get away. But Jesus seems to do all he can to turn this man away. How could something this promising end with him walking away? Did Jesus have a problem witnessing to rich people? Well, 
Certainly not. We, we know Jesus has had successful conversations with wealthy men. Nicodemus responded to Jesus' message about being born again. And so did Zacchaeus, and we're going to be looking at him in, in, in three weeks. But, but it's different here. You know, Jesus does, according to his purposes, the conversations and the outcomes are ordered by the Lord, and there's something we need to learn, and this is no exception. As we follow the story, Jesus makes a series of points that are important to affirm in order to enter the kingdom of God. And so our theme is that what is impossible for us to do is possible for God, and I didn't have to think long and hard to make that up, because it's right in the text. Now the first thing that Jesus does is ask a probing question. Do you have a clear sight of the uniqueness of Christ's character? The man asks a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, as he so often does, answers a question by asking a question. The man has come with the desire to get on Jesus' good side. Good teacher, what must I do? What must I do? He calls Jesus good, but he doesn't know the half of it. Jesus says, why do you call me good? He thinks Jesus is a good man like himself. To call a rabbi good is an honor. But Jesus is not just good, you see, he's God. Only God is good. They're not in the same league. Jesus is saying, your goodness, the kind of goodness that, that you think you may have, and the goodness of God are in completely different worlds. You're not the same, not by a long shot. He needs to learn something. Jesus is saying, I am good because I am God. By this man's standard of goodness, he's pretty good. He's moral, he's religious, he's hardworking. He's rich. He's the kind of man, the rabbis said, were blessed with God's smile. One of the privileged ones because of his money. But, but he's not good enough. Jesus does not come right out and say this. He simply says no one is good but God alone. You are right to call me good. I'm good because I'm God. The road to the kingdom begins at the point of recognizing the person of Jesus Christ. If we are going to get into the kingdom, we have to receive his goodness. We need a righteousness that is not man-made, as Paul said in Romans, a righteousness that's not from ourselves, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that is from God and is received by faith. The second thing the text points out is, is a loving correction. Do you know the depth of your own sinfulness? You and I need to know that we cannot enter the kingdom because we are good, but because we are totally unable to find any goodness in ourselves that can gain credit with God and can open the door of heaven. Our goodness cannot earn it. Our money cannot buy it. Now this is, this is counterintuitive in our world today. It says you want it. You go get it. You want spiritual fulfillment? Just look inside you and it's there. It isn't, but that's what the world would say. And this man thinks, you know, I'm pretty good. All I need is a little bit of character improvement. I've done a lot, but just to be on the safe side, I'll see if there's anything else, perhaps a little extra credit I can gain. Or maybe, just maybe, I will hear him say, you're good enough. Thanks for asking, but you're in. And so he asks, what must I do? And Jesus gives him an answer that sounds good to the man. Jesus takes him at face value to get him to see the insufficiency and failure of his work. You want to do something? Okay, let's work on that for a minute. Here it is. You want something to do, do the Ten Commandments. 
I mean, you know the commandments, don't you? And of course he knows the man does. And he ticks them off. And he does not begin with the first four commandments, the first table of the law, which have to do with our relationship with God. He, he ticks them off beginning with, the, with our relationship with our fellow man. And so he mentions commandments six, seven, eight, and nine. Don't commit adultery, uh, don't, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness. He even says these little words, do not defraud, which really are not a part of the Ten Commandments, but some people say it's there because he may have seen something in the man. He must have known that perhaps he had defrauded somebody, and that's one of the reasons why he's rich. But uh, I don't really know the answer to that. And then he jumps back to commandment five, honor your father and your mother. And Jesus doesn't start with the first four, which tell of his relationship with God. You see, it's much easier to be a moralist and to boast of law keeping when we talk about five through ten. Jesus already sees that this man has no real relationship with the Father, and that be, will become clear when Jesus gets to the end. And so he says, let's just talk about the law as it relates to one another. Well, the man must think the discussion is going well. He's unaware of his spiritual blindness. And so he says, okay, Jesus, this is good. I've kept all of those things since I was a boy. You see, his understanding is external. He, he's like the Apostle Paul before his conversion. He could have said, as for legalistic righteousness, I am faultless. He thought he was alive spiritually, but he was dead, and he didn't know it. The man was sincere. He was eager. But he didn't get it. And, and Jesus doesn't say at this point what you would think he would say. Wait a minute. Now, you can't keep those laws. I got gotcha. you. I fooled you. The, the commandments are designed not to give you confidence in yourself, but to show you your incompetence. <clears throat> Committing adultery involves even the lust that's in your mind. Murder is not an external act alone. It, it involves uh, moments of hatred uh, toward another person. So you see, you can't do it. And what you must do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Why don't you just tell him that, Jesus? But Jesus uses another tactic. In one brief sentence, he exposes the sin in his heart and reveals that he is not able to enter the kingdom unless something radical changes. And I love that next phrase, Jesus looked at him with love and said, one thing you lack. It's been suggested that the young man must have been Mark because only a person who's involved in it could have seen that look. It's a very personal look. And so people say, well, if it was Mark, he went away and repented and became a disciple. And that fits better my understanding of the story that, that Jesus never fails in his conversations with people. Well, let me say something here. More probably, Peter must have told Mark about that look. Mark, when he wrote all of the stories, got the information from Peter. So something, something struck Peter about the look, and Peter saw the look, remember after he denied Christ three times and Jesus was arrested, and Jesus is passing through the courtyard under arrest, and he looks at Peter, and Peter saw that look, that, that look of love that's, that said, Peter, I'm going to die for you, and, and that look that bore right through him. Jesus had that, had that incredible look. And there's a teaching point at, the, at this point for us because, you see, we, we've got to look at other people with love even when we have to speak the truth. We live in a day when, when the Christian majority is now gone. There's a Christian minority. In fact, our, our religion, is our, our faith is, uh, is demeaned for, by the most part in our, in our society anymore. And uh, love doesn't mean that you have to agree. To disagree does not mean you hate.
his heart went out to the man. He looked at him with love, and then he said, one thing you lack. And somehow we have got to learn in this day and age what it means for the church of Jesus Christ to both look with love and to speak hard truth. And we're going to have to learn that. The, th the third thing I see in the text is, is this impossible command. We, we need to know this third thing if we're to enter the kingdom. It is the failure of our own resources and our absolute need for Jesus. One thing you lack, only one. Now you kids, I, I just talked to some of you today about school. For, for many of you, school is only 25 days away. If you go to Upper Moreland, if you go somewhere else, it's like 35 days away, but that time's going to go fast. You say, thanks a lot for reminding us that, that the summer is going so fast. But if you take a test, and there are 50 questions on the test, and you get one wrong, would you say that's a good grade? That's a 98, right? Two points off. That's, that's an A. One thing you lacked. You got that question wrong. And we go, wow, only one thing. But, but in our spiritual testing, it is only one thing that causes us to be guilty of breaking it all, says James, if, you, if, you're, if you're off at one point. And it is that one thing, Jesus says, only one thing that can keep you from heaven. It can keep the door of heaven closed. And if it's that one little thing that keeps the door of heaven closed, it is a huge thing. Your money, your wealth is your God. What's he saying? What's the one thing? Jesus left off the 10th commandment. You shall not covet. And coveting is not just wanting what somebody else has, but in the broadest sense, it is coveting, it is wanting, it is needing, it is clamoring for, it is holding on to even the things that God gave you. It, it, it's, it's, the, it's the jealousy, it's the, it's the holding on. And, and Jesus says, you, you've only made one small error. You're guilty of, of coveting. And coveting is at the heart of breaking all of the commandments. And so you want, Jesus says to the man, you want to do something? Okay, let's do something. Here is what I want you to do. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. That's it. One short sentence from Jesus exposes his covetous heart and he has nothing else to say. And according to Jesus, he cannot get in. And so he went away sorrowful. Now Jesus here is not saying, and understand me here, he is not saying that it is a sin to be rich. Of course not. It is hard to see your need if you have great wealth. It is difficult to enter the kingdom, and so we, we hear this proverbial saying, it's harder for a camel. It's like a camel trying to pass through the eye of a needle. It's a, it's a funny image, but it's very serious business. It's not a sin to be rich. There are plenty of rich people in the Bible. Abraham, for one. A and in history, rich people who use their wealth for a lot of good. And so the, the point, I think, is if you have it, hold on to it loosely. Be generous with it. If you lose everything and still have Jesus, you have all you need. This is also not a call to an ascetic lifestyle. It's not a, a statement that it's better to be poor than to be rich. You know, a person who covets riches and cannot get them can be just as lost as a, per as a rich person who will not part with his riches. In fact, all of us have something, don't we? That one thing, you think about what that is, which we will not let go of. It's the thing that we cannot live without. And it's the thing which, if we lost it, would totally devastate us. One thing you lack, and, and I can't answer that for you. I can seek by the Spirit of God to answer that for me. But then Jesus has a word for his disciples. They're floored by what Jesus told the man. Notice what he says in verse 24. He calls them children. That, that, that sweet, uh, welcoming word. 
probably referring back to the passage that led off this section. Children do not have anything except what their parents give them. He's, remi he's reminding them that they really have nothing. To a child, only one thing matters, whether they can verbalize it or not. They have their father to provide everything. And here's the fourth point. Jesus then gives us a focused teaching. That which is impossible with man is possible with God. The disciples see this man walk away, and they are no doubt troubled. Is salvation possible for anyone? This is the response that Jesus was looking for. If this good, upright, and religious man cannot get in heaven, what hope is there for the rest of us? <laughs> and Peter adds, you know, we didn't have as much to lose as this man does, but, but we still left it all behind to follow you. Well, yes, they did. But that is not what will save them. It is not what we do. To ask the question is to seek the answer. Who can be saved? I wish that the young man had asked the question before Peter did. Who then can be saved? How can I be saved? Is there any hope for me? I can't give it all away and give it to the poor. I wish he understood the point Jesus was making. I wish he said, I see it now. I can't do what it takes. What you are asking for is impossible. For him to ask that question is to reveal the grace of God in his life. The answer, of course, is that salvation is a gift of grace. It is impossible with us, but God has provided the way. And this is where context is so important. Because, you see, we saw it at the front end, becoming like a child to enter the kingdom of God, but now we see it at the back end. The next conversation reveals what Jesus will do to open the door of heaven. And we see that in verses 32 through 34. He will be arrested. He'll be flogged. He's going to be turned over to the Romans. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be put to death. This, this is connected to what is necessary for us to enter the kingdom of God. And on the third day, he will rise again. You see, it's our sins that must be punished. It is our sins that must be laid on the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But now he is alive, and this living Lord Jesus died, rose again, and this is our hope. He did the work that was necessary to provide eternal life. It's as if Jesus were saying to, to, to them and, and to us, you can't do the work, but here is the work the Father called me to do. Perfect obedience through my life and perfect obedience in being willing to die for my Heavenly Father. That's the way we find eternal life, putting our faith and our trust in Him. And that for the last point of the passage, it is the surprising riches that Jesus mentions. Whatever you lose, whatever idol you relinquish, whatever sacrifice you would make for Jesus will be replenished by Jesus. You lose your wealth, you lose your land, you lose your family. Jesus says, I'll replace it a hundredfold. Verse 30. You'll receive, will you not receive a hundredfold now in this time? Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. <laughs> you will never be alone. You will never be destitute because you'll be a part of a kingdom family. This is how we encourage one another. There is no family like the family of God. Yes, with all of our failures, with all of the reasons that we have to be long-suffering, with all the offenses that need to forget, be forgiven, 
We long for our eternal rest in heaven, but here on earth, Jesus says, there is an abundance of blessing. And it's not by storing up your treasures here on earth, it is by storing up your treasures in heaven. And then he says, yes, even persecution will be added to the mix. Jesus, why would you say that? I mean, what a downer. I love the stuff you're going to give me here. The, the, these riches, I don't fully understand what they are, but, but I want them, but not persecution. And, and, but listen, the inclusion of persecution probably foreshadows the fact that the disciples have not yet given up everything. Peter says, we've, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus says, wait a minute, Peter. The cause of the gospel is going to cause you to be arrested, you to be persecuted, you to be killed. You have not given it all up. I'm going to ask you to give the full measure of sacrifice. I'm going to want your very life. That's not easy. But it's the road to eternal life. Now, you know, what, what can we do with this? What, what, what's the takeaway from a text like this? The first thing I want you to do is to, this is really important, I want you to see the difference between gaining eternal life and entering the kingdom. I mean, the man's question is, what do I need to do to to, to gain eternal life, and Jesus never talks really about eternal life. Three times throughout the text, he says this is a way to enter the kingdom of God. The man wants heaven, and Jesus asks, do you want the kingdom? Now you may say, Pastor, aren't you making a, a little kind of a picky difference? I don't think I am. Beware of any talk of eternal life that does not include the kingdom. Because kingdom life is a call to obedience. It is a call to a faith that works itself out in obedience. I don't care if you talk to me about receiving Jesus. If you are not in the kingdom of God, you are lost. The passage is a warning, certainly. It's a warning against health, health and wealth. Name it and claim it. All this in Jesus too. I hope you, I hope you see that. But it's also a warning against easy believism. Just tell me what I can do and then I can get in and, and then all my life's my own. I want to get in but I don't want to count the cost. I'm not interested in being a disciple. I just want to be a Christian. And according to the word of God, you cannot be one without the other. So you need to ask God to reveal that one thing that you may be holding on to, that you need to give up. I don't think, it's too simplistic to say, and it's impossible that he would be asking you to do the same thing he asked of this young man. He's not. He's not asking you to do what he asked the young man to do. He's asking you to, to think of that one thing, that place of covetousness that you're holding on to. What's the thing that I need to get rid of? Am, am I willing to be generous? Am I willing to part with that which others need? Am I holding on to it loosely? And do, does all the stuff that I hold on to, all the stuff that I keep, does that really belong to him? And how will we, he asked me to use that. How will you use what you keep? And where is the idol in your heart? And then I want to ask you to do one other thing, and that is that you would redouble your commitment to the body of Christ. That's where the passage ends. Brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers a hundredfold. Here's where the visible dimensions of the kingdom of God are worked out, right? In the body of believers. Have you ever heard anybody say, I, I want to I go to heaven, I just don't want to go to church. <laughs> I've said that, and I'm the pastor, you know. We need the body. Some of you know this, some of you do not. One of the, one of the means by which he cares for you 
And the blessings and the gifts that he gives you is in the direct provision, prayer, and encouragement of one another. It's like the guy caught on the roof of the flood and he said, Lord God, you know, save me. And he sends a boat by, you know, and he says, no, I don't need a ride. I'm waiting for the Lord to deliver me. You've heard that joke, right? You know, every, every, everything God sent, they said, I wanted God to deliver me and God's sending people. And that's what we need. You, you know, I said in the beginning, this passage doesn't involve a miracle. I was wrong. It really does involve a miracle, doesn't it? Because if there is anything that's impossible with us that is only possible with God, then that one thing that is possible with God becomes a miracle for us. Because it is divine intervention. The repentance in your heart, the holding on to Jesus for salvation is the miracle of grace. It is the miracle of eternal life. What's impossible with man is possible with God. Let's pray together.